in everything. And Lord God, I pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds as we go into this word and we see how you use this man, Apollos, to raise up to be a, a, gospel, minister, a gospel minister in this place. And Lord God, I pray that you would see, help us see how this can apply to our lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, Paul was finishing up his second missionary journey. And he... Is that better? Paul was finishing up his second missionary journey, and he had to make a stop in Ephesus. Well, while he was there, he can't ever go anywhere and not preach the gospel. So he preached the gospel to the, there in Ephesus, and like I said, something happened. God was at work. God, Paul was faithful to do what God had called him to do. He preached there in Ephesus, and they pleaded with him to stay. But he said, no, I can't. I've got to go, because he had other work to do. He had to be obedient to God's will in his life. So what he did is, like I said, he left Priscilla and Aquila there. But while he was gone, God, in his mighty sovereign act, rose up a man to be a gospel minister there in Ephesus, for Ephesus. And that man was this man named Apollos. And this whole passage that we just read is about Apollos and about the work he did in Ephesus. So what we're going to do now is, is we're going to look, and I'm going to give you guys six things about Apollos that, may, that kind of stands out that we can learn from this passage to see how he was so influential. First of all, we see that in verse 24, he was a Jew from Alexandria, Egypt. Now you may be thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Well, you remember Alexandria was that place in the ancient world that had that huge library that was so influential, had all the knowledge in the world was there. And it was also the place that Alexander the Great had founded to be a great influential intellectual center. So, and it also had a large Jewish population. And given the fact that he was a Jew and had been well educated, we can surmise that Apollos came from a, a relatively wealthy family so he could get an education. So he was a Jew from Alexandria. And then he had a knowledge. It says at the end of verse 25 and the end of verse 24, it says he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. And being from Alexandria, it's possible that he had a university level education. Huge intellectual center. A lot of learning going on here. I mean, like I said, you had this big library at Alexandria, a lot of knowledge, a lot of learning. This is where a lot of the great Greek philosophers and orders came from. And he had the opportunity to be right there with them. He was possibly influenced by philosophers such as Phileo Judeus, who was one of the main influential Jewish scholars back in the first century who was responsible for much of the uh, biblical interpretation we have today. It says he knew the Old Testament scriptures. At the time, the only scriptures they would have had would have been the Torah and the Old Testament, but he knew them well. And the, because he, and like I said, that all goes back to his roots, knowing them well, being of Jewish background. So he had an opportunity, he had a knowledge that surpassed many of the Jews that he, that he encountered. But he had a limited knowledge. It says he only knew the baptism of John. Well, what does that mean? We've all heard the baptism of John. Well, let's look at that. If you go back with me and look at Matthew chapter 3. So let's turn back to Matthew chapter 3 real quick. And starting in verse 1, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Sing as loud. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now if you look down to verse 11, it says, John's, this is John speaking, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So how did Apollos know the baptism of John? Well, given the fact that Alexander the Great had conquered the entire known world at the time, century, a century or two before, People were able to travel about more, were able to get around better, so, and knowledge was able to permeate all throughout the region. Thus, we can, many scholars believe 
that some of John's disciples made their way down into Egypt and began influencing the Jewish culture there, preaching this baptism of repentance. But unfortunately, that's all he knew. Because remember, John was beheaded long before Jesus was crucified. So, the, so, the, so I think Warren Wiersbe was saying how they wouldn't have known anything about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They wouldn't, known, they wouldn't have had this knowledge of substitutionary atonement, faith, salvation through grace by faith. They wouldn't have known any of that. But they would have known that the Messiah had come. The Messiah was coming, and you needed to repent in order, like you said, you needed to, be, to repent so that you wouldn't be thrown into the fire. So he had limited knowledge, but that knowledge didn't stop him from going forth to do what God called him to do. Verse 25, we can see he had, a, he had a certain attitude. And this attitude was he was fervent in spirit. Here, fer, here the Greek word for fervent is the word zeo, which means hot or boiling. So it can be said that he had a hot desire to do the work of God. I mean, it was burning up inside him. He had no other driving force other than to do the work of God. And so... He traveled 1,700 miles from Alexandria to Ephesus, roughly 1,700 miles. That's a long way to go to preach the gospel message. It reminds me of these missionaries that we have all around the world that are going to China and they're going to Africa and they're going to parts of the Middle East where Christianity is illegal just so they can preach the gospel. They have such a strong desire to go forth and preach the gospel. And that's the same fervent desire that he had. And we see in verse 26 that he began writing, he began working right away. It says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So when he got there, he began working right away. He knew where the Jews were. He, him, Jews, he himself was a Jew, so he knew where to find the other Jews. And he went and began preaching the things he'd heard about Jesus from John the Baptist, or from the disciples of John. But you can imagine how surprising it was for Priscilla and Aquila. Remember the, the, the two that Paul left in Ephesus you can imagine how surprising it was for them to hear a Jew speaking a similar message that they had been teaching, that they had heard. And this leads to his teachable spirit. So he's got a, so Apollos has got a, a favorable background. He has a knowledge. He had a positive attitude. And now he's going to show that he has a teachable spirit. He had great knowledge, but what Priscilla and Aquila did is says they heard him and they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They explained the way of God to him more accurately. Now, this is something they would have done in private. They would have taken him aside and probably heard what he had to say, probably invited him over to their house, would have had dinner with him, and, be like, we, and would have probably said something along the lines of, we like what you're saying. You're correct in what you're saying, but there's more. And he was humble enough to say, tell me, teach me more. Being, being a great, being this guy that had um, all this knowledge and all this learning, you would think that he was like, oh, I don't need to hear all that. What are you talking about? But no, he had a teachable spirit because verse 27, it talks about him wishing to go to Achaia. It doesn't say that he, it doesn't say that he refuted them and said, no, I don't want to hear what you have to say. No, as a result of their teaching, he desired to do more. So he had the best tutors, Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, they traveled with Paul. They supported him. They sat under Paul's teaching. They were the ones who were qualified to be at that place at that time to help minister to the man who was going to minister to Ephesus in Paul's, in Paul's absence. Like I said, they took him aside privately and taught him things. They probably taught him something like, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing but the gift of God. But they may have taught him, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so they might receive adoptions as sons. They filled in that gap of knowledge that he had so he could be an effective minister. 
They filled in that gap of knowledge so he can proclaim the word of God more accurately and more effectively. And whatever they taught him, when they were done, they, he had salvation. And he was able to teach the way of salvation also. We see he was a man of great speech. In verse 24 it says he was an eloquent man. And the word used here in the Greek is logios, not logos, logios. Which is an adjective to describe someone who is learned and highly skilled in literature and the arts and also skilled in speech. So he's probably a professional orator. He was an orator or professional speech giver. He could speak in such a way that you would be, you would, he'd be able to hold your attention. He would be able to speak clearly and effectively, and then he could convince you he's right when he's done. And as a result of that, he spoke boldly. He spoke boldly. The, the phrase that is used in the Greek is a word I can't pronounce because I don't have a cool accent like Pastor Anton, means that he was able to speak with frankness and without reservation. So he, and he was confident in his, in his speech and his demeanor. He could give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Keep your attention and convince you he was right. And you'd walk out of there feeling good about it. And then his work. See, God had picked out Apollos long ago to come and do this work in Ephesus. Three times in this scripture, it talks about him doing a work. In verse 25, it says, He spoke and taught accurately things concerning Jesus. In verse 27, it says, When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. And then verse 28, it says, For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that, Jesus, that Christ was Jesus. So it sounds to me like, that he, was one of the, that he was an apologist. He could be akin to what we would refer to as an apologist today. I'm not saying he was one, but it just from, from reading this and studying this, it sounds to me like he was someone like Robbie Zacharias, Frank Turek, Sean McDowell. Those people who are eloquent in speech, who know the scriptures, who are able to teach it and defend the faith. So if Paul went there and planted... Like it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul planted and Apollos watered. Apollos was the man who, who came in, like I said, to fill in the gap, to help these people be built up in their faith, be strong in their faith. Because I know I'm always encouraged and feel stronger in my faith after I listen to an apologist speak. Because they talk about stuff I'd never thought about. They're able to apply things to, they're able to apply it and make it, and make it what's the word I'm looking for? It sounds reasonable. They're able to reason it out. And that's what Apollos did. He says once he went to it, once he left Ephesus, having done the work God had called him to do there, he wished to go into Achaia to continue his work. He didn't want to sit still and idle. He wanted to go and continue the work. So he went to Ephesus. He went to Achaia, which is in Corinth. Remember the place that Paul was in, in the beginning of chapter 18. So he was going back to the place where Paul had originally been to help continue to encourage the work there, to build up the church there. He was, build, he was already building up the church in Ephesus, but he had to continue on his work. So Apollos was a man who had a remarkable background. He had a great knowledge. He had incredible speech. He had a great attitude. He had the best teachers. And he became a powerful influence in the, in the early church. He was one of the key players in the early church. Because Paul talks about him several times in the New Testament in the scriptures. But sometimes it's not, sometimes not a very good light because people became divided and started following after Apollo. Some followed after Peter or Cephas. Some followed after Paul. But that's not the point. The point is that he was instrumental in building up the early church. But what does that really have to do with you and me? How does hearing about someone who did work in the first century in this, in this little church in Asia Minor, or in Greece, have to do with us? Well, what we have here is we have a glimpse, we have a little picture of 
what it takes to be an effective worker for Christ. We have a glimpse of what a person must do in order to spread the gospel. And these, this isn't, this isn't a, a, a have to, must have to list, but these are just good things to do in order to be effective. If you want to live a good witness, if you want to have a good witness. So first of all, we see that Apollos was educated, yet he remained teachable. He had a high level education, university level education. He might even been PhD level. He was a smart guy, super smart guy. But he remained teachable because he knew and he discovered that his knowledge wasn't complete. Pastor Anton has a seminary degree. I have a seminary degree. My wife is a nurse practitioner. She has a master's degree. But yet, in order to be effective in what we do, we have to remain teachable. We, don't have, we cannot think so highly of ourselves as to be like, well, I, I don't need any help. I know everything. I know I don't know everything. Hopefully, Pastor Anton knows he doesn't know everything. Turn that down just a little bit. And when I say be educated, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to school to get a Bible degree. But what I do encourage you to do in reading this is, is read your Bible. That's how, that's how God speaks to us, is through his word. I saw this thing on Facebook where this guy was crying. I said, Lord God, speak to me. And the next thing you do, you see a hand reaching through the clouds with a Bible in his hand. That's how the Lord speaks to us, is through his word. Read your Bible. In 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 6, I'm going to start in the middle of the verse. It says, being trained in the words of the faith, the words of the faith, and of the good doctrine that you have followed, have nothing to do with irre um, irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promises for the present life and also for the life to come. It holds the promises for the present life and also for the life to come. Does it, Hebrews 11, 1 say that faith is the assurance of things not seen? Our faith in Christ comes from hearing and hearing from the, by the word of God, by reading this book. By studying your Bible is where you get this education that is necessary for godliness, for being an effective minister. Sure, it's great, it's great to go to Bible studies. It's great to, it's great to go to school and do all these other things. But its foundation is built in Scripture, in the Word of God. So he was educated. So be educated. Read your Bible. And also says, and he was also teachable. Don't think you can't learn anything. You can always learn something new every day. Every day. Several years ago when I was working for the power company, one of the best things that I was taught was one of my foremen told me, he said, he said every day when you come to work, learn something new and retain it. Learn something new. And, and hold on to it, retain it. Because you never know, if you learn something new, you may come across somebody else who needs to hear what you've learned. So you can teach them. Hopefully they have a teachable spirit. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.13 says, Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me and the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. So here in this letter... Timothy, Paul is reminding Timothy, he said, you learned from me, so continue in that. So just like in, in what I learned from Pastor Anton, when he's mentoring me, I try to continue in that. I try to encourage my kids, what they learned from me, to continue in that. To continue in what I teach them, because I know that if they follow the, if I'm teaching them the Bible, I'm teaching them Scripture, and they follow in that, then they'll have that foundation to build upon themselves when they get older. Always be teachable. And then 
Second thing we can learn from this is that Paulus, Apollos was encouraged, and he was an encourager. Apollos was encouraged, and he was an encourager. If you look back at Acts chapter 18, verse 26, it says, Priscilla and Aquila heard him, and they took him aside and explained to him the, th the way of God more accurately. They saw a great potential in him. They saw in him that there was, God was working in his life. So what they did was they went to him privately, like I said. They probably brought him home, had dinner with him, and they encouraged him. They said, we love what you're doing. They think this is great. You're speaking the truth, but there is more. Let me show you the way in that. Let me teach, let us teach you the way more accurately so you can be a better teacher. Isn't it great to be encouraged? Isn't it great when people say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. But let me help you do better. Let me help you do better. I always, I was always built, I was I always thought it was great when someone would come alongside me and say, hey, Joey, I really like what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Keep it up, but let's, let's, let's do it better. Let's do it better. Let me help you be better. Pastor Anton's a great encourager. And I I'm, I'm feel very blessed and privileged to be able to work under him. So if you don't have someone in, walking with you in your life to encourage you, find somebody. Find a, find a close friend, a trusted friend, a godly friend to walk with you and encourage you in your life. And not only was Apollos encouraged, but he also became an encourager himself. When it, also, it also says that when he wished to cross the way, the brothers encouraged him. They said, heck yeah, go. Get out of here. Go do it. Go do what God has called you to do. And then he crossed, he went into Achaia to be an encourager to those, to those believers in the church in Corinth. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, Paul is telling the church in Thessalonica, and it says, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak and be patient with them all. This is a direct command to be engaged with the people in your life to help encourage them and build them up. So no man is an island. No person is an island. We can't live this life on our own. We need encouragement and we need to encourage others. We need to be in a position in our life to where if we're not being encouraged, we need to be humble. We need to be humbled enough to say, hey, to go to somebody you trust and say, hey, I need help. I need help here. And then also look for opportunities to encourage others. This thing is sensitive. And finally, so Apollos was educated, yet he remained teachable. Apollos was encouraged and an encourager. And then Apollos was engaged. He was engaged. He traveled 1,700 miles to go from Egypt to Ephesus to preach the gospel. We have a hard time getting people to go five minutes down the road to knock on a neighbor's door to tell them about Jesus. Who in your life can you tell about Jesus? What has God called you to do? Obviously, in Matthew 28, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he, te he commands people to go forth into all nations and to make disciples of all people. If you want to know what to do, go do that. God's given you an explicit command to go be engaged in his work. Paul had his role in the church. He was a church planter. He had planted the seed. Priscilla and Aquila had their role in the church, and Apollos had his role in the church. What's your role? Are you fulfilling your role? Or are you just filling a pew? Each one of them recognized their role within the body, and they did it. See, this, this thing called the church, this, these people here, y'all are the church. This building is not the church. 
and each, each part, and we're the body of Christ. Each person in here has a specific role to fill within the church. And if you're not doing your role effectively, chances are the body is not operating effectively. I remember when I had, I had an ingrown toe, an ingrown toe on my right big toe. And it, even though it's a small thing, it hurt like you wouldn't believe. It caused me so much pain. And whenever I'd kick it, I was reminded it was there, and I had to stop for a few, for a few minutes, catch my breath, and not freak out because it hurt so bad. So if you find yourself in a position in a church where you're just a big toe, be a healthy big toe. Because you know what big toes do? Other than help you find furniture in the dark? Is they help you keep your balance. They help, they help you stand up straight. There's a reason for every role and every part of the, of the body of Christ. If you want to read more about it, I encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 31. I'm not going to go there because it's going to take a long time. But, but be engaged in the work in the church. Find your role and fill it. Do something. Don't just come fill a chair. So we've seen how God can bring a man over 1,700 miles to do God's work. An incomplete man. But remember, God doesn't always call the, call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God qualified Apollos for his work, to do his work. He gave him the right tools. He sent him to the right place, and he gave him the right teachers at the right time to do his work. Why? Because Apollos was faithful to the calling in his life. God was the sovereign Lord of Apollos' life, but is he the sovereign Lord of your life? Are you, call, are you doing what God called you to do? Are you living the life that God called you to live? So I know this is a, a little bit shorter, but if the praise team could come back up here as we get ready to close out. What are you doing? What are you doing for the Lord, Christian? What are you doing for the Lord? Are you living your life as an example for God? Are you living your life as an example of Christ? Are you fulfilling that role that God has called you to do? And or are you just kind of sitting by the wayside waiting for someone else to do it? Are you living your life in accordance with God's plan or are you trying to do your own thing? Or maybe there are those in here who don't know Jesus, who don't know that there, who don't realize that there is a plan for their lives. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking about what are you talking about, Joey? What is this work that God would have someone to do? Well, first of all, do you know Jesus? Have you realized the need for a Savior in your life? Has God, has God put his finger on your heart? Has he said, now, today is the day of salvation in your life. Today is the day that you turn your life around and you come to me, you surrender to me because of what I've done for you. These are all things that So as we, consider, as we consider what God is doing in our own lives and what the Holy Spirit and what in each, in each role that we've been called to and each thing that we've been assigned to do, think about what God has called you to do. Think about where he'd have you work. And if you see where God is working, go there. Go be a part of where God is working. I know God is at work here in this church, in this place. I've seen it. So if you want to be a part of where God's working, he's working right here. How can you get plugged in? How can you get involved? Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to be able to preach your word and to bring this message today about a man who was committed to your calling in his life to do your work, but was also humble enough to receive correction and teaching in the things of the Lord.
Lord God, I pray that each one of us in this building would remain teachable and we would remain engaged in your work. And Lord God, I pray for those that maybe don't know you or maybe haven't made a commitment to Christ. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch their hearts and touch their minds and help them realize their need for you. I pray, Lord, that you would call them into salvation. And I pray, Lord God, that you would bring them into the fellowship and that your name will be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.